There are three kinds of valid explanation for Federer's ascendancy. One kind involves mystery and metaphysics and is, I think, closest to the real truth. The others are more technical and make for better journalism. The metaphysical explanation is that Roger Federer is one of those rare, preternatural athletes who appear to be exempt, at least in part, from certain physical laws. Good analogs here include Michael Jordan. Footnote number seven. When asked during the aforementioned special one-on-one -on -one interview for examples of other athletes whose performances might seem beautiful to him, Federer mentions Jordan first, then Kobe Bryant, then a soccer player, like guys who play very relaxed, like a Zinedine Zidane or something. He does great effort, but he seems like he doesn't need to try hard to get the results. Federer's response to the subsequent question, which is what all he makes of it when pundits and other players describe his own game as beautiful, is interesting mainly because the response is pleasant, intelligent, and cooperative, as is Federer himself, without ever really saying anything, because, in fairness, what could one say about others' descriptions of him as beautiful? What would you say? It's ultimately a stupid question. It's always what people see first, for them. That's what you are best at. When you used to watch John McEnroe, you know, the first time, what would you see? You would see a guy with incredible talent, because the way he played. Nobody played like this. The way he played the ball, it was just all about feel. And then you go over to Boris Becker, and right away you saw a powerful player, you know? Note. N.B. Federer's big conversational ticks are maybe and you know. Ultimately, these ticks are helpful because they serve as reminders of how appallingly young he really is. If you're interested, the world's best tennis player is wearing white warm-up pants and a long-sleeve white microfiber shirt, possibly Nike. No sport coat, though. His handshake is only moderately firm, though the hand itself is like a carpentry rasp. For obvious reasons, tennis players tend to be very callousy. He's a bit bigger than TV makes him seem. Broad-shouldered, deep in the chest. He's next to a table that's covered with visors and headbands, which he's been autographing with a sharpie. He sits with his legs crossed and smiles pleasantly and seems very relaxed. He never fidgets with the sharpie. One's overall impression is that Federer is either a very nice guy or a guy who's very good at dealing with the media, or, most likely, both. End of note. When you see me play, you see a beautiful player. And maybe after that, you maybe see that he's fast. Maybe you see that he's got a good forehand. Maybe then you see that he has a good serve. First, you know, you have a base, and to me, I think that's great, you know? And I'm very lucky to be called basically beautiful, you know, for style of play. With me, it's like the beautiful player, and that's really cool. End of footnote number seven. Who could not only jump in humanly high, but actually hang there a beat or two longer than gravity allows, and Muhammad Ali, who could really float across the canvas and land two or three jabs in the clock time required for one. There are probably a half dozen other examples since 1960, and Federer is of this type. A type that one could call genius, or mutant, or avatar. He is never hurried or off balance. The approaching ball hangs, for him, a split second longer than it ought to. His movements are lithe rather than athletic, like Ali, Jordan, Maradona, and Gretzky. He seems both less and more substantial than the men he faces, particularly in the all-white that Wimbledon enjoys getting away with still requiring. He looks like what he may well, I think, be, a creature whose body is both flesh and, somehow, light. This thing about the ball cooperatively hanging there, slowing down, as if susceptible to the Swiss's will, there's real metaphysical truth here. And in the following anecdote, after a July 7th semifinal in which Federer destroyed Jonas Bjorkman, not just beat him, destroyed him, and just before a requisite post-match news conference in which Bjorkman, who's friendly with Federer, says he was pleased to have the best seat in the house to watch the Swiss play the nearest to perfection you can play tennis. Federer and Bjorkman are chatting and joking around, and Bjorkman asks him just how unnaturally big the ball was looking to him out there and Federer confirms that it was like a bowling ball or basketball. He means it just as a bantery, modest way to make Bjorkman feel better, to confirm that he's surprised by how unusually well he played today, but he's also revealing something about what tennis is like for him. Imagine that you're a person with preternaturally good reflexes and coordination and speed, and that you're playing high-level tennis. Your experience in play will not be that you possess phenomenal reflexes and speed. Rather, it will seem to you that the tennis ball is quite large and slow-moving, and that you always have plenty of time to hit it. That is, you won't experience anything like the empirically real quickness and skill that the live audience, watching tennis balls move so fast they hiss and blur, will attribute to you. Footnote number eight. Special one-on-one -on -one support from the man himself for this claim. It's interesting, because this week, actually, Ansic, comma Mario, the towering top 10 Croatian whom Federer beat in Wednesday's quarterfinal, played on center court against my friend, you know, the Swiss player Warinka, comma Stanislas, Federer's Davis Cup teammate. 
and I went to see it out where, you know, my girlfriend Mirka Favernech, a former women's top 100 player, knocked out by injury, who now basically functions as Federer's Alice B. Toe class, usually sits, and I went to see, for the first time, I have come here to Wimbledon. I went to see a match on center court, and I was also surprised, actually, how fast, you know, the serve is, and how fast you have to react to be able to get the ball back, especially when a guy like Mario Ansic, who's known for his vicious serve, serves, you know? But then once you're on the court yourself, it's totally different, you know? Because all you see is the ball, really. And you don't see the speed of the ball. End of footnote number 8. Velocity is just one part of it. Now we're getting technical. Tennis is often called a game of inches, but the cliche is mostly referring to where a shot lands. In terms of players hitting an incoming ball, tennis is actually more a game of micrometers. Vanishingly tiny changes around the movement of impact will have large effects on how and where the ball travels. The same principle explains why even the smallest imprecision in aiming a rifle will still cause a miss if the target's far enough away. By way of illustration, let's slow things way down. Imagine that you, a tennis player, are standing just behind your deuce corner's baseline. A ball is served to your forehand. You pivot or rotate so that your side is to the ball's incoming path and start to take your racket back for the forehand return. Keep visualizing up to where you're about halfway into the stroke's forward motion. The incoming ball is now just off your front hip, maybe six inches from point of impact. Consider some of the variables involved here. On the vertical plane, angling your racket face just a couple degrees forward or back will create topspin or slice, respectively. Keeping it perpendicular will produce a flat, spinless drive. Horizontally, adjusting the racket face ever so slightly to the left or right and hitting the ball maybe a millisecond early or late will result in a cross-court versus down-the-line return. Further slight changes in the curves of your ground strokes motion and follow through will help determine how high your return passes over the net, which, together with the speed at which you're swinging, along with certain characteristics of the spin you impart, will affect how deep or shallow in the opponent's court your return lands, how high it bounces, etc. These are just the broadest distinctions, of course, like there's heavy topspin versus light topspin, or sharply cross-court versus only slightly cross-court, etc. There are also the issues of how close you're allowing the ball to get to your body, what grip you're using, the extent to which your knees are bent and or weights moving forward, and whether you're able simultaneously to watch the ball and to see what your opponent's doing after he serves. These all matter, too. Plus there's the fact that you're not putting a static object into motion here, but rather reversing the flight and, to a varying extent, spin of a projectile coming toward you, coming, in the case of pro tennis, at speeds that make conscious thought impossible. Mario Antrich's first serve, for instance, often comes in around 130 miles per hour. Since it's 78 feet from Antrich's baseline to yours, that means it takes 0.41 seconds for his serve to reach you. Footnote number 9. We're doing the math here with the ball traveling as the crow flies, for simplicity. Please do not write in with corrections. If you want to factor in the serve's bounce and so compute the total distance traveled by the ball as the sum of an oblique triangles, note. The slower a tennis court's surface, the closer to a right triangle you're going to have. On fast grass, the bounce's angle is always oblique. End of note. Two shorter legs. Then by all means go ahead. You'll end up with between two and five additional hundredths of a second, which is not significant. End of footnote number nine. This is less than the time it takes to blink quickly. Twice. The upshot is that pro tennis involves intervals of time too brief for deliberate action. Temporally, we're more in the operative range of reflexes, purely physical reactions that bypass conscious thought. And yet an effective return of serve depends on a large set of decisions and physical adjustments that are a whole lot more involved and intentional than blinking, jumping when startled, etc. Successfully returning a hard serve tennis ball requires what's sometimes called the kinesthetic sense, meaning the ability to control the body and its artificial extensions through complex and very quick systems of tasks. English has a whole cloud of terms for various parts of this ability. Feel, touch, form, proprioception, coordination, hand-eye coordination, kinesthesia, grace, control, reflexes, and so on. For promising junior players, refining the kinesthetic sense is the main goal of the extreme daily practice regimens we often hear about. Footnote number 10. Conditioning is also important, but this is mainly because the first thing that physical fatigue attacks is the kinesthetic sense. Other antagonists are fear, self-consciousness, and extreme upset. Which is why fragile psyches are rare in pro tennis. End of footnote number 10. The training here is both muscular and neurological. Hitting thousands of strokes, day after day, develops the ability to do by feel what cannot be done by regular conscious thought. Repetitive practice like this often looks tedious or even cruel to an outsider, but the outsider can't feel what's going on inside the player. Tiny adjustments, over and over. 
and a sense of each change's effects that gets more and more acute even as it recedes from normal consciousness. Footnote number 11. The best lay analogy is probably to the way an experienced driver can make all of good driving's myriad little decisions and adjustments without having to pay attention to them. End of footnote number 11. The time and discipline required for serious kinesthetic training are one reason why top pros are usually people who've devoted most of their waking lives to tennis, starting, at the very latest, in their early teens. It was, for example, at age 13 that Roger Federer finally gave up soccer and a recognizable childhood and entered Switzerland's National Tennis Training Center in Ukublins. At age 16, he dropped out of classroom studies and started serious international competition. It was only weeks after quitting school that Federer won Junior Wimbledon. Obviously, this is something that not every junior who devotes himself to tennis can do. Just as obviously, then, there is more than time and training involved. There is also sheer talent, and degrees of it. Extraordinary kinesthetic ability must be present, and measurable, in a kid just to make the years of practice and training worthwhile. But from there, over time, the cream starts to rise and separate. So one type of technical explanation for Federer's dominion is that he's just a bit more kinesthetically talented than the other male pros. Only a little bit since everyone in the top 100 is himself kinesthetically gifted, but then, tennis is a game of inches. This answer is plausible but incomplete. It would probably not have been incomplete in 1980. In 2006, though, it's fair to ask why this kind of talent still matters so much. Recall what is true about Dogma and Wimbledon's sign. Kinesthetic virtuoso or no, Roger Federer is now dominating the largest, strongest, fittest, best trained and coached field of male pros who've ever existed with everyone using a kind of nuclear racket that's said to have made the finer calibrations of kinesthetic sense irrelevant, like trying to whistle Mozart during a Metallica concert. According to reliable sources, honorary coin tosser William Keynes's backstory is that one day, when he was two and a half, his mother found a lump in his tummy and took him to the doctor, and the lump was diagnosed as a malignant liver tumor, at which point one cannot, of course, imagine a tiny child undergoing chemo, serious chemo, his mother having to watch, carry him home, nurse him, then bring him back to that place for more chemo. How did she answer her child's question, the big one, the obvious one? And who could answer hers? What could any priest or pastor say that wouldn't be grotesque? It's 2-1 Nadal in the finals, second set, and he's serving. Federer won the first set at love but then flagged a bit, as he sometimes does, and is quickly down a break. Now, on Nadal's ad, there's a 16-stroke point. Nadal is serving a lot faster than he did in Paris, and this one's down the center. Federer floats a soft forehand high over the net, which he can get away with because Nadal never comes in behind his serve. The Spaniard now hits a characteristically heavy topspin forehand deep to Federer's backhand. Federer comes back with an even heavier topspin backhand, almost a clay court shot. It's unexpected and backs Nadal up, slightly, and his response is a low hard short ball that lands just past the service line's tee on Federer's forehand side. Against most other opponents, Federer could simply end the point on a ball like this, but one reason Nadal gives him trouble is that he's faster than the others, can get to stuff they can't, and so Federer here just hits a flat, medium-hard cross-court forehand, going not for a winner but for a low, shallowly angled ball that forces Nadal up and out to the deuce side, his backhand. Nadal, on the run, backhands it hard down the line to Federer's backhand. Federer slices it right back down the same line, slow and floaty with backspin, making Nadal come back to the same spot. Nadal slices the ball right back. Three shots now all down the same line, and Federer slices the ball back to the same spot yet again, this one even slower and floatier. And Nadal gets planted and hits a big two-hander back down the same line. It's like Nadal's camped out now on his deuce side. He's no longer moving all the way back to the baseline center between shots. Federer's hypnotized him a little. Federer now hits a very hard, deep topspin backhand, the kind that hisses, to a point just slightly on the ad side of Nadal's baseline which Nadal gets to in forehands cross-court, and Federer responds with an even harder, heavier cross-court backhand, baseline deep and moving so fast that Nadal has to hit the forehand off his back foot and then scramble to get back to center as the shot lands maybe two feet short on Federer's backhand side again. Federer steps to this ball and now hits a totally different cross-court backhand, this one much shorter and sharper angled, an angle no one would anticipate, and so heavy and blurred with topspin that it lands shallow and just inside the sideline and takes off hard after the bounce and Nadal can't move in to cut it off and can't get to it laterally along the baseline because of all the angle and topspin. End of point. It's a spectacular winner, a Federer moment, but watching it live, you can see that it's also a winner that Federer started setting up four or even five shots earlier. Everything after that first down-the-line slice was designed by the Swiss to maneuver Nadal and lull him and then disrupt his rhythm and balance and open up that last, unimaginable angle, an angle that would have been impossible without extreme topspin. 
Extreme topspin is the hallmark of today's power baseline game. This is something that Wimbledon's sign gets right. Footnote number 12. Assuming, that is, that the signs with heavy topspin is modifying dominate rather than powerful hitters, which actually it might or might not. British grammar is a bit dodgy. End of footnote number 12. Why topspin is so key, though, is not commonly understood. What's commonly understood is that high-tech composite rackets impart much more pace to the ball, rather like aluminum baseball bats as opposed to good old lumber. But that dogma is false. The truth is that, at the same tensile strength, carbon-based composite rackets are lighter than wood, and this allows modern rackets to be a couple ounces lighter and at least an inch wider across the face than the vintage Kramer or Max Ply. It's the width of the face that's vital. A wider face means there's more total string area, which means the sweet spot's bigger. With a composite racket, you don't have to meet the ball in the precise geometric center of the strings in order to generate good pace. Nor must you be spot on to generate topspin, a spin that, recall, requires a tilted face and upwardly curved stroke, brushing over the ball rather than hitting flat through it. This was quite hard to do with wood rackets, because of their smaller face and niggardly sweet spot. Composites lighter, wider heads, and more generous centers let players swing faster and put way more topspin on the ball, and, in turn, the more topspin you put on the ball, the harder you can hit it, because there's more margin for error. Topspin causes the ball to pass high over the net, describe a sharp arc, and come down fast into the opponent's court, instead of maybe soaring out. So the basic formula here is that composite rackets enable topspin, which in turn enables ground strokes vastly faster and harder than 20 years ago. It's common now to see male pros pulled up off the ground and halfway around in the air by the force of their strokes, which in the old days was something one saw only in Jimmy Connors. Connors was not, by the way, the father of the power baseline game. He wailed mightily from the baseline, true, but his ground strokes were flat and spinless and had to pass very low over the net. Nor was Bjorn Borg a true power baseliner. Both Borg and Connors played specialized versions of the classic baseline game, which had evolved as a counterforce to the even more classic serve and volley game which was itself the dominant form of men's power tennis for decades, and of which John McEnroe was the greatest modern exponent. You probably know all this, and may also know that McEnroe toppled Borg and then more or less ruled the men's game until the appearance around the mid-1980s of A. Modern Composite Rackets, footnote number 13, which neither Connors nor McEnroe could switch to with much success. Their games were fixed around pre-modern rackets. End of footnote number 13. And B. Ivan Lendl, who played with an early form of composite and was the true progenitor of power baseline tennis. Footnote number 14. Form-wise, with his whippy forehand, lethal one-hander, and merciless treatment of short balls, Lendl somewhat anticipated Federer. But the check was also stiff, cold, and brutal. His game was awesome but not beautiful. My college doubles partner used to describe watching Lendl as like getting to see Triumph of the Will in 3D. End of footnote number 14. Ivan Lendl was the first top pro whose strokes and tactics appeared to be designed around the special capacities of the composite racket. His goal was to win points from the baseline, via either passing shots or outright winners. His weapon was his ground strokes, especially his forehand, which he could hit with overwhelming pace because of the amount of topspin he put on the ball. The blend of pace and topspin also allowed Lendl to do something that proved crucial to the advent of the power baseline game. He could pull off radical, extraordinary angles on hard-hit ground strokes mainly because of the speed with which heavy topspin makes the ball dip and land without going wide. In retrospect, this changed the whole physics of aggressive tennis. For decades, it had been angle that made the serve and volley game so lethal. The closer one is to the net, the more of the opponent's court is open. The classic advantage of volleying was that you could hit angles that would go way wide if attempted from the baseline or midcourt. But topspin on a ground stroke, if it's really extreme, can bring the ball down fast and shallow enough to exploit many of these same angles especially if the ground stroke you're hitting is off a somewhat short ball. The shorter the ball, the more angles are possible. Pace, topspin, and aggressive baseline angles. And lo, it's the power baseline game. It wasn't that Ivan Lendl wasn't a mortally great tennis player. He was simply the first top pro to demonstrate what heavy topspin and raw power could achieve from the baseline. And most important, the achievement was replicable, just like the composite racket. Past a certain threshold of physical talent and training, the main requirements were athleticism, aggression, and superior strength and conditioning. The result, omitting various complications and subspecialties. Footnote number 15. See, for one example, the continued effectiveness of some serve and volley, mainly in the adapted, heavy ace and quickness dependent form of a Sampras or Raptor, on fast courts through the 1990s. End of footnote number 15. Has been men's pro tennis for the last 20 years, even bigger, stronger, fitter players generating unprecedented pace and topspin off the ground.
trying to force the short or weak ball that they can put away. Illustrative stat. When Leighton Hewitt defeated David Nalbandian in the 2002 Wimbledon men's final, there was not one single serve and volley point. Footnote number 16. It's also illustrative that 2002 was Wimbledon's last pre-Federer final. End of footnote number 16. The generic power baseline game is not boring, certainly not compared with the two second points of old time serve and volley or the moon ball tedium of classic baseline attrition. But it is somewhat static and limited. It is not, as pundits have publicly feared for years, the evolutionary end point of tennis. The player who's shown this to be true is Roger Federer, and he's shown it from within the modern game. This within is what's important here. This is what a purely neural account leaves out, and it is why sexy attributions like touch and subtlety must not be misunderstood. With Federer, it is not either or. The Swiss has every bit of Lendl and Agassiz's pace on his ground strokes, and leaves the ground when he swings, and can out hit even Nadal from the backcourt. Footnote number 17. In the third set of the 06 final, at three games all in 30 15, Nadal kicks his second serve high to Federer's backhand. Nadal's clearly been coached to go high and heavy to Federer's backhand, and that's what he does, point after point. Federer slices the return back to Nadal's center and two feet short, not short enough to let the Spaniard hit a winner, but short enough to draw him slightly into the court. Whence Nadal winds up and puts all his forehand strength into a hard, heavy shot to, again, Federer's backhand. The pace he's put on the ball means that Nadal is still backpedaling to the baseline as Federer leaves his feet and cranks a very hard topspin backhand down the line to Nadal's deuce side, which Nadal, out of position but world-class fast, reaches and manages to one hand back deep to again Federer's backhand side. But this ball's floaty and slow, and Federer has time to step around and hit an inside-out forehand. A forehand as hard as anyone's hit all tournament, with just enough topspin to bring it down in Nadal's ad corner. And the Spaniard gets there but can't return it. Big ovation. Again, what looks like an overwhelming baseline winner was actually set up by that first clever semi-short slice and Nadal's own predictability about where and how hard he'll hit every ball. Federer sure welled that last forehand, though. People are looking at each other and applauding. The thing with Federer is that he's Mozart and Metallica at the same time, and the harmony's somehow exquisite. By the way, it's right around here or the next game, watching, that three separate inner type things come together and mesh. One is a feeling of deep personal privilege at being alive to get to see this. Another is the thought that William Keynes is probably somewhere here in the center court crowd, too, watching, maybe with his mum. The third thing is a sudden memory of the earnest way the press bus driver promised just this experience. Because there is one. It's hard to describe. It's like a thought that's also a feeling. One wouldn't want to make too much of it, or to pretend that it's any sort of equitable balance. That would be grotesque. But the truth is that whatever deity, entity, energy, or random genetic flux produces sick children also produced Roger Federer. And just look at him down there. Look at that. End of footnote number 17. What's strange and wrong about Wimbledon's sign, really, is its overall dolorous tone. Subtlety, touch, and finesse are not dead in the power baseline era, for it is, still in 2006, very much the power baseline era. Roger Federer is a first-rate, kick-ass power baseliner. It's just that that's not all he is. There's also his intelligence, his occult anticipation, his court sense, his ability to read and manipulate opponents, to mix spins and speeds, to misdirect and disguise, to use tactical foresight and peripheral vision and kinesthetic range instead of just rote pace. All this has exposed the limits, and possibilities, of men's tennis as it's now played. Which sounds very high-flown and nice, of course, but please understand that with this guy it's not high-flown or abstract. Or nice. In the same emphatic, empirical, dominating way that Lendl drove home his own lesson, Roger Federer is showing that the speed and strength of today's pro game are merely its skeleton, not its flesh. He has, figuratively and literally, re-embodied men's tennis, and for the first time in years the game's future is unpredictable. You should have seen, on the grounds outside courts, the variegated ballet that was this year's junior Wimbledon. Drop volleys and mixed spins, off-speed serves, gambits planned three shots ahead, as well as the standard issue grunts and booming balls. Whether anything like a nascent Federer was here among these juniors can't be known, of course. Genius is not replicable. Inspiration, though, is contagious and multiform. And even just to see, close up, power and aggression made vulnerable to beauty is to feel inspired and, in a fleeting, mortal way, reconciled.